On July 19, 1977, the world teacher, the Christ Maitreya, head of the spiritual hierarchy, emerged from his ancient retreat and is now in the modern world. With his disciples, the Masters of the Wisdom, he will inaugurate the new age of synthesis and brotherhood. Good morning and welcome to our World Teacher Program on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM. Presented by Teresa and David on behalf of Share International New Zealand. Our program today features extracts from a keynote talk titled The Art of Living, given by Benjamin Krem in August 2005 in the USA. This is an introduction to the subject and we'll use more of this lecture in a future program. Mr. Krem begins. This talk is about the art of living. It is probably the most important subject one could be talking about, although the vast majority of people on earth have no idea that living is an art. Since it is an art, it does not just happen by chance. The laws and rules underlying the art must be understood and followed. Only then will we have a world in which all its inhabitants are living in right relationship, expressing their divinity, their potential godhood. If we do not know that there are laws and rules, we end up as we are today and at all times previously in a mess, a catastrophic situation, totally out of kilter with the idea of an art. We are in a period of extreme disarray in our world, politically, economically and socially. We are all aware of it. Increasingly, the masses of people are becoming aware of it and are beginning to fret and feel the chafing of these wrong structures, wrong laws, wrong habits, in other words, conditioning, and are seeking ways out of them. That is producing the upheaval which we see in the world today. In education, we are taught to read and write, which of course is very important. We are taught a little bit of history, geography, arithmetic, mathematics generally, and that's about all. We are taught to some extent how to learn at least the concrete knowledge of our particular science or needed skill, and that is all. We are not taught how to live, the art of living. There is no school where we can go to learn the art of living. It is a spiritual problem because the art of living is tied up with living itself. We are living at an extraordinary time, a transitional period between two great ages, so that what seemed constant before is no longer constant. Knowledge that seemed certain is no longer certain. All we see is the past and possibly hints of the future and we are torn, standing in the middle. Mr. Krem then says, I would like to further this thought by reading an article that my master wrote for the October 1983 edition of Share International. Before long, a great change will take place in our approach to life. Out of the chaos of the present time will emerge a new understanding of the meaning underlying our existence and every effort will be made to express our awareness of that meaning in our daily lives. This will bring about a complete transformation of society. A new livingness will characterize our relationships and institutions. A new freedom and sense of joy will replace the present fear. Above all, mankind will come to realize that living is an art, based on certain laws requiring the function of the intuition for correct expression. Harmlessness is the key to the new beauty in relationship which will emerge. A new sense of responsibility for actions and thoughts will guide each one in every situation. An understanding of the law of cause and effect will transform men's approach to each other. A new and more harmonious interaction between men and nations 
will supplant the present competition and distrust. Gradually, mankind will learn the art of living, bringing to each moment the experience of the new. No longer will men live in fear of the future and of each other. No longer will millions starve or carry the burden of labour for their brothers. Each one has a part to play in the complex pattern being woven by humanity. Each contribution is uniquely valuable and necessary to the whole. However dim as yet the spark, there is no one in whom the fire of creativity cannot be lit. The art of living is the art of giving expression to that creative fire and so revealing the nature of men as potential gods. It is essential that all men share in this experience and learn the art of living. Until now a truly creative life has been the privilege of the few. In this coming time the untapped creativity of millions will add a new luster to the achievements of man. Emerging from the darkness of exploitation and fear, in true and correct relationship, each man will find within himself the purpose and the joy of living. The presence of the Christ and the Masters will speed this process, inspiring humanity to saner and safer methods of advance. A new simplicity will distinguish the coming civilization under the guidance of these knowers of God. Already there is a growing sense that all is not well in man's estate. More and more men are becoming aware of the limitations of their lives and search for something better. They question the modes and structures which inhibit participation in the fullness of life and long for meaning and purpose in all that they do. Shortly new energies will enter our lives and inspire men to creative action. A new and harmonious stimulus will be given to art and the art of living. A beauty not seen before will transform the ways of men and illumine for all time the nature of God. Man stands now ready for revelation. His heart and mind poised and turned to the future he awaits the glory which, by readiness, he has invoked. That concludes the Master's article. Mr. Kremp continues. The soul knows the meaning of life. It knows the purpose underlying our existence. It knows why we are here. We do not know why we are here. We do not know who we are or our purpose. This is because we have allowed ourselves to be broken off from the source of our being, which is the soul. We do not even know the human threefold constitution. We do not know that every man and woman is fundamentally a potential God. We are sparks of the divine, fragments of the divine, with all of divinity inherent in that spark. The spark of God, the divine spark, reflects itself as a soul and the soul reflects itself as the man or woman on the physical plane. The physical plane is tied to the spiritual planes by the fact of the soul. The soul acts as the divine intermediary between the spiritual plane, that which is not in matter, and matter itself, the physical plane. They are in polarity. The soul also fills the life and demonstrates the nature of the unseen aspect of man, the divine aspect, and describes that in its works, whether in science, music, painting, architecture or whatever. It expresses itself correctly above all when it creates right relationship. It expresses itself incorrectly if the opposite results. When we look around at our world today, we see almost nothing but wrong relationships. If you have wrong relationships, you have conditioning. If you have conditioning, you have wars. All the wars, the suffering, the inability of humanity to demonstrate itself as souls in incarnation are the result of conditioning. Every single human being is conditioned by the past, by its parents, by the very nature of its vehicles 
which have been created for it by its soul under the law of karma. Yet no one need be conditioned. That great law determines the physical nature, the emotional coloration and the mental factor of that individual. Karma brings it about and allows it to create right relationships in its short demonstration. However short or long the life, it gives the person the opportunity to address the issues, to redress the wrongs done in the past and to resolve them, and therefore to make better human relationships in a particular life. We come into incarnation over and over again to enable us to right the wrongs of the past. Our wrongs, not the wrongs of other people. Very few people in the West believe in reincarnation, although a growing number of people accept it as an intellectual idea, possibly true. They do not quite know what it means, but they say, maybe in my last life I was a cat, that is why I like cats so much. That is the understanding of Western people on reincarnation. In the East, millions of people have accepted reincarnation as part of the nature of their lives, but even they have not understood how that great law works. Life proceeds under law. Simple and obvious as it appears, it is something which has been left out of the equation. How many people, how many philosophers writing about the meaning and purpose of life write about reincarnation as one of the laws? the great law of life. It is only in the esoteric teaching that the law of karma, the law of cause and effect, is realized for what it is. Jesus put it very simply, as you sow, so shall you reap. It could not be put more simply, and you would think more understandably. As you sow, whether in a cornfield or not, you will reap what you have sown. In good soil, with good seed, if you are lucky with the weather, then you get a good crop. If you sow bad seed and do not prepare the soil properly, you are going to get a poor crop. It is very simple. He put it that way because his audience were farmers and would know what he meant. But he is talking about the law of karma absolutely clearly. He put it so neatly that nobody takes it very seriously. Just one of those truisms which are not lived in practice. The law of karma, the law of cause and effect, is the great law governing all of our existence. Every thought, every action we make sets into motion a cause. The effects stemming from these causes make our lives for good or ill. We do it to ourselves. Because this law substands the human condition on planet Earth, we are bound by it. There is nothing we can do about it except be harmless. If you are harmless, you obey the law. If you create right action, therefore, from right action can come only right reaction. But nine times out of ten, given the chance, humanity has created wrong action. We have always made wars. We have always stolen. We have always been greedy, selfish and complacent. All these actions, which make up humanity's stock in trade, are destructive. Hence the fact that we have a world that is destructive. We have a world of earthquakes, floods, tsunamis and other catastrophes. We have air crashes, train crashes, car crashes and all the horrors of the physical plane. We know disease. We are killed by it. We are inhibited by it. We quickly age by it. Disease is a result of our wrong thought and action, and the wrong thought and action of our progenitors, because we inherit the tendency to one disease or another through our genetic framework.
You're listening to the World Teacher Program on Wellington's Access Radio, 106.1 FM. Benjamin Krem continues. So, what can we do? It is obvious that we have to create harmlessness in every situation, in all relationships. When we create harmlessness in all relationships, we will find that the world is an easier, better, kinder, more harmonious place in which to live. It seems so simple, but we find it incredibly difficult. It is so difficult to live in an artful way. I do not mean in an artful dodger way, but in a way that is graceful, elegant and meaningful, which obeys the laws of our nature, the fact that we are potential gods, ways which are filled with creativity. We are lucky if we have the leisure to become creative, but it needs leisure. Most people today do not have the leisure. They may have the time, but time and leisure are not quite the same. They need the education, the instruction. They need the stimulus and the conditions in life of harmony, of harmlessness. They need to be eating at least once, preferably twice a day, and to know where their food is coming from. Unfortunately, there are millions of people in the world who do not have that pleasure, who hardly ever eat, who cannot remember when they last had a meal. Millions of people are dying in a world groaning with food. The world is so full of food that we do not know what to do with it. Sections of the world throw food away daily, and at the same time millions die for want of it. It is a terrible, painful situation, or should be painful. It is painful for the people who are neglected. It should be painful for all of us. It should be a pain, a catastrophe in life, to know that this continues daily, hourly, moment to moment. People are walking across deserts looking for aid agencies who they have heard are handing out food. Someone has said there is food being handed out, but eight days trek across the desert if they can make it. They take their children and walk across the desert. This is the reality for millions of people. It should be so shocking, so painful, that we cannot stand it for one more day. As the Master said, the time is coming when we will look back at this time absolutely unbelieving, unable to understand how we could do it. Quote, when in future times men look back to these climactic days, they will wonder with astonishment and disbelief at the ease with which we tolerate the iniquities of the present the cruelty and pointless suffering which so besmirch our lives." Unquote. We take it so easily, even those of us concerned about it, who write and talk about it, join groups, and applaud the work of the non-governmental agencies who distribute food unceasingly. It is difficult to imagine how, as a race, we can put up with this state of affairs. For how long, Maitreya says, can you support this degradation? It is a degradation of our life. It is a degradation of our reality as potential gods. We are so-called spiritual beings who do not demonstrate our spirituality. We know it, but do not do it. We have not the will to do it. Humanity in its present state is able to see the harm, the need, the horrors of today's world and shake their heads and give a donation to an aid agency. What is needed is the will of humanity aroused, not just its concern, to cleanse the world of these ills. There are many more horrible iniquities in the world, terrible pain and suffering, disease and drug abuse. The use we make of other people, the unbelievable intolerance we have for other nationalities, other colours of men. We think that we are quite well educated, well evolved. Obviously we are not. Mr. Krem concludes by saying, I believe it will take my Maitreya to show humanity this inequity, to show just how pressingly horrible it is. We all know it is horrible, but is it pressingly painful? Can we think about it with equanimity? If we can think about it with equanimity, 
and it does not disturb us too much, then obviously we are not at all that civilised, not at all that evolved. The Masters see humanity as having reached a point where they have the readiness to learn. That is why the Masters are here. We have invoked them by being ready as never before to follow the precepts of the Masters and to create harmony and justice. And that concludes the extract from Benjamin Krem's keynote talk on the art of living. If you would like to know more about the reappearance of Maitreya, the world teacher, and the Masters of Wisdom, we'll be giving our contact details after this extract from Maitreya's message number 13. My dear friends, I am happy indeed to be with you once more in this way. My mission is proceeding according to plan and if all goes well you will soon hear my voice meanwhile I would say this Mankind has lost its way, has strayed far from the path prepared for it by God. Many there are now in the world who know this, who search and pray and work towards the light. But many more are blind and would rush towards disaster. My plan is to halt this headlong plunge and to turn the tide. My presence already is affecting changes in men's thinking, in men's hearts, and causing them to wonder. My efforts are proving effective despite all appearances. Men are turning again to the truth, to the laws which are God. Allow me to 
to show you the way into the new time, to outline for you the glories which, if you will, can be yours. Man is made to serve both God and man, and only through that correct service can the path to God be trodden. Make it your task to take upon yourselves the task of reorientation, reconstruction and change. And that ends our program today. For more information you can call us on 0636461001. That's 0636461001 or visit share-international.org. To inquire about Share International magazine subscriptions, our monthly free of charge newsletter, or books by Benjamin Krem, please phone 04234-1133. That number again is 04234-1133. Or you can write to P.O. Box 9576 Wellington. Thank you for listening to us on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM. And please tune in to our next World Teacher Programme on Saturday the 11th of July at the usual time of 10 a.m. You can listen again to this program and previous ones by visiting our website at share-international-nz.info and click on the radio tab. Mm -hmm.